next lecture, uh, and that will be on quite different uh, material, I'm sure, um, because now we shall hear a contribution by Moshe Benovitz, um, who is Professor of Talmud and Rabbinics uh, at the university in this city. Um, <clears throat> author of a book called Nidre, Studies in the Development of Rabbinic Votive Institutions. Uh, no veterans there. Um, <clears throat> and uh, several volumes of, of uh, of comprehensive critical commentary on sections of the Talmud, uh, numerous articles on Talmudic scholarship. Um, and so he will address us on ritual and the road, the Roman Mao, <coughs> so there is Roman stuff in there, the Roman mile as a measure of space and time in rabbinic halacha. <coughs> Thank you, Professor Isaac, Professor Nehoff. <coughs> the various compendia of rabbinic literature that form the basis of Jewish practice to this day originated with one major exception in Roman Palestine. The Mishnah, Tosefta, Halachic Midrashim, and the Palestinian Talmud were all compiled between the years 200 and 400 of the Common Era in the land of Israel, though they contain earlier traditions. The Babylonian Talmud, the largest and most influential collection of rabbinic lore, was redacted for the most part in the sixth century CE in Babylonia, but it too consists mainly of discussions of Palestinian material. It is thus not surprising that the standard measure of distance in rabbinic literature is the Roman mile. The mile perseveres even in the Babylonian Talmud alongside the Persian Parsang, which is about four times the distance and with which the mile is sometimes confused. For the rabbis, the Roman mile was not just an abstract unit, it was a fact of life in the form of the milestones which measured the distance of a mile on the roads of the Galilee and the rest of Roman Palestine and the Roman Empire. In fact, as we shall see, the Roman mile was so ubiquitous and so well known that it was even used to measure time in a unit called Kedei Hiluch Mil, the time it takes to walk a mile. I was unable to locate this means of measuring time in any other culture. Many cultures measure distance by time, as in the biblical Derech Yom, or the Greek Hodon Hemeras, or the medieval Vechstunde. But as far as I can tell, measuring time by distance is unique to rabbinic sources. In this lecture, I will survey certain key examples of the use of the mile as a measure of distance, and the time it takes to walk a mile as a measure of time in rabbinic literature, examples of which can teach us much about both ritual and the road in Roman Palestine. I will begin by asserting in no uncertain times that the rabbinic meal or mile is in fact the Roman mile, a fact which will be obvious to this audience. In a land with roads dotted by milestones, the use of any other measure of distance called meal is out of the question. And numerous examples which we shall cite, which include citations of distances between towns in Palestine in miles, prove that when the rabbis of the first centuries of the Common Era referred to the meal in Hebrew and Aramaic, they meant the Roman mile. But it is necessary to state this because traditional commentators on the Talmud, both medieval and modern, mistakenly believe that the meal is roughly equivalent to one kilometer rather than being identical to the Roman mile. This is because they were unfamiliar with the Roman mile and assumed that the rabbinic mile is related to the biblical unit called the amma, the cubit. Rather than interpreting the mile as mile pasum, 1,000 paces, 
They interpreted it as the equivalent of 2,000 biblical cubits. The measure of 2,000 cubits is a measure found in the biblical description of the Levitical cities in Numbers 35.5. It is also found in early rabbinic sources concerning the Sabbath limit, the distance one may travel from one's hometown on the Sabbath. Now, a biblical cubit is about half a meter, while a Roman pace is about three quarters of a meter. Thus, 2,000 cubits would be approximately one kilometer, while mile passum would be about a kilometer and a half, a little, a little bit uh, more. This conflation, confusion caused much misunderstanding of Talmudic passages in later halachic works. The issue has been thoroughly researched by the Belgian engineer and Talmudic scholar J. Jean Eidler in his article, Talmudic Metrology One, published in the bar University Journal BDD and available on the web. For our purposes, it is not really relevant, since we are dealing with the original meaning of the sources of Talmudic halacha in late antiquity, rather than their later interpretation in Europe and in Jewish ritual by some rabbis today. It is important to mention this discrepancy, however, because the English Wikipedia has an article unfortunately mistitled Biblical Mile, in which it is asserted that the mile in Jewish tradition was and always has been a distance of 2,000 cubits. Biblical here is used in the sense of Jewish. This is an especially confusing and misleading misnomer for readers from the English-speaking world, because the mile, a word derived from the Latin mile passum, 1,000 paces, is of course not mentioned at all in the Hebrew Bible, and it is mentioned once in the Sermon on the Mount in the Christian Bible, Matthew 5.41, source one on your sheets. If anyone presses you into service for one mile, go with him too. And that, of course, is the Roman mile. It should be noted that the article on the same topic in the Hebrew Wikipedia is more nuanced and not at all misleading. It is entitled Mil Bahalacha, Mile in Halacha, and it correctly asserts that because of a medieval misinterpretation of the word meal in the Talmud, in some contemporary Jewish ritual, a mile is considered roughly equivalent to a kilometer, and it cites the research of J. Jean Adler, cited above, showing that contemporary scholarship considers this a misunderstanding of classical rabbinic sources. While the English title and content of the Wikipedia article are very misleading, it is completely understandable and not at all surprising that confusion about the length of a mile was prevalent among traditional medieval commentators in the Talmud. In non-Jewish medieval society as well, the name mile was given to distances that had nothing whatsoever to do with the Roman mile passum. The Gemeine Deutsche Meile was about the length of five Roman miles, or seven and a half kilometers. The Scandinavian Mil, used to this day in Norway, is closer to seven Roman miles, or 10 or 11 kilometers. So actually, the notion of medieval rabbis that a mile is about one kilometer is closer to the mark than that of their non-Jewish contemporaries. Now that we have gotten that issue out of the way and established that the meal in rabbinic sources of late antiquity is in fact not 2,000 cubits or a kilometer, but a mile, mile passum, a thousand paces, we will turn to specific examples of the way the mile is used in rabbinic literature. Our first examples are the simplest. They refer to distances between cities, and they reflect the fact that these distances were common knowledge because of the ubiquitous milestone on Roman roads. Probably the road traveled most by the Palestinian rabbis of late antiquity was the road between Tiberias and Sepphoris, two major centers of rabbinic learning in late antiquity. Source two and three on your handout refer to court venue. Mishnah Sanhedrin 3.2 states that plaintiff and defendant can each reject the other's judge. The passage, which dates to the second century CE, is very difficult to understand, since presumably the plaintiff should be the one who chooses the venue by suing the defendant in a certain court. Both Talmudim ask why the defendant should be allowed to reject that court and pr propose a different venue. 
in the Palestinian Talmud, Sanhedrin 3221a, source three on your handout, the third century rabbi, Rabbi Yochanan, says that the defendant can only reject the venue in which she was sued if he proposes an alternative consisting of more knowledgeable judges. His contemporary Rabbi Elazar gives the following example. If one says, let us try the case in Tiberias, and the other says, let us try the case in Sepphoris, we listen to the one who said Tiberias. Tiberias being the seat of the patriarchate and the um, highest rabbinic academy at the time. Fourth century Rabbi Eli explains Rabbi Elazar's statement that the more authoritative court of Tiberias should be preferred, even if suggested by the defendant, as referring only to a case in which the litigants themselves live in a place equidistant from the two cities. Otherwise, the plaintiff's choice of the closest court is to be preferred. That which Rabbi el said, if one says in Tiberias and the other says in Sepphoris, refers only to a case in which they reside in that town called Mashkana, located nine miles from the one and nine miles from the other. Mashkana is cited as the halfway point between Tiberias and Sepphoris in another passage in the Palestinian Talmud as well, number four on the handout, concerning distance from God. I don't know why it's not moving, but okay. Well, look on your handout anyway. Um, said second century sage, Rabbi Simeon ben Lakish, in a scroll of the pious it was found written, when you leave me for one day, I will leave you for two. Okay. This can be compared to two people, one of whom set out from Tiberias and the other from Sepphoris, and they met in that town called Mashkana. They did not have an opportunity to take leave of one another, and one walked an additional mile, and the other walked an additional mile. They find themselves two miles distant from one another. Thus, if you forget God for one day, you will find that he is two days distant from you. A milestone was found outside of Mash, the uh, Hirbet Mesh, 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 Maskana, the, Arab, uh, the ruin of the Arab town, which is said to be the place of Mashkana, and it is exactly equidistant. Um, okay. Source five on the handout refers to the celebration of the festival of Purim. Last week, we celebrated the festival of Purim in Jerusalem on Wednesday, the 15th of Adar, and in the rest of Israel and the Jewish world on Tuesday, the 14th of Adar. Residents of Tiberias and other walled cities in Talmudic times also celebrated on the 15th of Adar. The third century Palestinian sage, Rabbi Joshua ben Levi, is quoted in the Babylonian Talmud as saying that not only the walled city itself, but also all that are nearby and seen from it count as part of it. That is why Jerusalemites today, even those living outside the walls of the old city, celebrate on the 15th of Adar. How far away is considered nearby? Said fourth century sage Rabbi Jeremiah and others say it was fourth century sage Rabbi Chia Baraba, like the distance between Hamat and Tiberias, one mile. Hamat is uh, uh, just south of Tiberias, uh, oh, hot baths, hot springs. And um, Tiberias is, of course, Tiberias. And let him say one mile. Why doesn't he just say one mile? Why does he have to say between Hamath and Tiberias? The Babylonian Talmud, which doesn't know which, where either of these places are, of course, says he comes to teach us that the distance between Hamath and Tiberia is one mile. This too was a road frequented by the rabbis of Tiberias, and the distance was presumably well known and marked by a milestone. Milestones have been found on the road from Tiberias to Scythopolis, of which this would have been the first mile, but no milestone has been found at this spot. And I, I think I have pictures. Do I have? Yeah. This is the museum in Ein Harod, uh, the Sturman Museum, and the Milestones outside were taken from the nearby road between Tiberias and Scythopolis. 
The next two sources I will address discuss performance of ritual on the road, literally. Some halachic rituals require access to fresh water, not always available on the road. One must wash one's hands before a meal, and when baking a day's worth of bread or more, one must separate an offering called challah from the dough, which in Talmudic times was given to a descendant of Aaron, a kohen or priest who must eat, must eat it when ritually pure. The one kneading dough must also be in a state of ritual purity in order that the offering remain pure. If the offering is impure, it must be burnt up. This ritual is still carried out today, and the offering is regularly thrown into the oven fire and burned. How important are these rituals? Both Talmudim discuss how far out of one's way a traveler must go in order to find fresh water for purification before kneading dough for bread with the concomitant offering, or in order to wash one's hands before a meal. Palestinian Talmud Chala 21558C, we read, said Rabbi Yossi in the name of Rabbi Shabtai and Rabbi Chia in the name of Rabbi Simeon ben Lakish, for the Chala offering and for hand washing, a person must walk four miles. In other words, if you're traveling on the road and you're baking on the way, or you have to eat on the way, you have to look for water uh, up to a distance of four miles away. Rabbi Abahu said, this is only if the four miles are ahead of him on his way, but we do not trouble him to go backwards. What about those who guard gardens and orchards, people who are sitting outside a distance from the town and water supply, who also must go out of their way to find water? Do we consider them as though walking forward or backward? Let us resolve this question on the basis of the following source. Oh, I'm going to skip that. I think, ah, it was taught. It's washing hands, if you're looking on the handout, go to the second paragraph. It was taught, washing hands before food is optional, and after food it is required. But in the former case, he washes and stops, while in the latter, he washes without stopping. What does it mean, washes and stops? Rabbi Jacob bar Acha said it means he washes his hands twice. Rabbi Jacob bar Isaac asked, you say it is optional, but then you say you have to do it twice? Why, if watching after food is optional, why, uh, uh, before food, I'm sorry, is optional, why do you say you have to rinse each hand twice? Thus, some say must, must walk four miles to see if water is available for washing, but others say it is optional. In other words, there were two opinions on the road as to whether you had to go out of your way four miles to seek water. The Babylonian Talmud likewise rules that a traveler on the road must walk an extra four miles in the direction he is heading in order to find water for these purposes, and adds the case of one who does not know his prayers by heart and therefore must pray the statutory daily prayers with a congregation. If he is on the road, he must walk four miles in the direction he is heading if there is a synagogue in the next town, but no more than that. The Babylonian Talmud also disagrees with the Palestinian Talmud regarding what the walk back and insists that a traveler who can find water behind him on the road must walk out of his way backwards up to the distance of a mile. Not more than, not a mile, but up to the distance of a mile. And that's the next source. Said Rabbi Abahu in the name of Rabbi Simeon ben Lakish, that's the Babylonian Talmud, Psachim 46a, for kneading dough and for prayer and for washing, four miles. Said Rabbi Yossi ben Hanina, four miles was only taught if he was walking in that direction. But to go backwards, he need, go back, he need not go back even one mile. Said Rav Acha, from this we can derive that he need not go back a mile, but if water or a congregation for prayer are to be found less than a mile behind him on the road, he must go back. The rabbis quoted in this passage, with the exception of Rav Acha, who insists on backtracking less than a mile, are from Palestina. In a discussion of hand washing before prayer in a different tractate of the Babylonian Talmud, later Babylonian rabbis used the measurement one parsang instead of four miles, the two being roughly equivalent. Source eight. Said Ravina to Rava, have you met that young rabbi who came from Palestine and said he who has no water to wash his hands can wipe them with dirt and pebbles and stubble? He said, Rav, Rava answered, he spoke well. 
For the scripture state, I shall wash with water. It states, I shall wash my hands in purity. Psalm 26, 6. Anything that purifies. For Rav Chista cursed anyone who goes looking for water at prayer time. This is only true for the recitation of the Shema. But for actual prayer, he must go looking for water. How far? A parsang. But that is only if he was walking in that direction. But to go backwards, he need, go back, he need not go back even a mile. From whence we can derive that although he need go back, not go back a mile, he must go back less than a mile. All of these examples reflect the ubiquitousness of the Roman milestone on Galilean roads, and more importantly, the natural way in which that led to the mile as a unit of measurement in the consciousness of the people of Palestine in late antiquity. As we have seen, this usage was so pervasive that it became commonplace among Babylonian rabbis of the period as well, who used the mile when recording rulings that originated in Palestine while preferring the parsang for later rulings that originated in Babylonia. The examples we have cited thus far all stem from Amoraic literature, which stems from the period extending from the year 200 to the year 500. In the earlier stages of rabbinic literature, the stadion, the Greek or Hellenistic unit of measurement, is used instead of or alongside the Roman mile. Although the earliest corpora of rabbinic literature were redacted in the early third century, they incorporate oral traditions passed down by the Tanaim, the rabbis of the first two centuries of the Common Era, and even earlier sages. Some modern scholars are skeptical of the antiquity of some of these traditions. But the use of the stadion instead of the mile in these early traditions would seem to indicate their antiquity, perhaps predating direct Roman rule in Palestine, and certainly predating the ubiquitous of the milestone from about the mid-2nd century. While those that cite distance in either both uh, stadia, either or both stadia and miles should be dated to a transitional period. We shall cite four examples from the main kapora of Tanaitic literature, the Mishnah and the Tosefta. In the first, stadia are used instead of miles. Source nine. Mishnah Bava Kama 7.7. Seven. One may not set traps for doves within 30 stadia of a settled area. This would indicate that the Mishnah predates the late second century, by which time the milestone had become ubiquitous in Palestine. And in the next passage, source 10, stadia and miles are both used as though they are two measurements in the same system. Tosefta Bavakama 8, 9 begins with the same, oh, oh sorry, right. I'm sorry, Tosefta Babakana 8 and 9. One may not set traps for doves within 30 stadia of a settled area, exactly as in the Mishnah. To which case does the statement refer? To one who is setting traps in the wilderness. But in the settled area itself, he may not set traps even 100 miles from the nearest domestic dovecote. How do we can count for this? Is it possible that the Tosefta, it is possible that the Tosefta reflects a period during which both stadia and miles were used. However, since the line B in the Tosefta is clearly a comment on line A, and line A is identical with the Mishnah, I would posit that the comment in line B was made after the mile had replaced the stadion as the standard unit of land measurement in Palestine and should be dated many years later than the Mishnah and line A. In the next passage, sources 11 and 12, the measure one stadion is deliberately translated into miles. The biblical passage, Exodus 23, 4 to 5, contains two laws regarding helping an enemy on the road. Verse 4 refers to the turn, return of your enemy's lost animal. Verse 5, to helping your enemy when his animal has collapsed under its load. And the verses, the biblical verses read as follows. If you encounter your enemy's ox or donkey straying, you must return it to him. Next law, if you see the donkey of one you hate, who hates you, sorry, fallen under its load, do not leave it there. You must help him with it. Um, the Midrash seeks to account for the discrepancy between the two cases. In the first, the Israelite is said to encounter his enemy's animal, and in the second, he is said to see it. 
The rabbis assume that both laws concern an animal sighted at the same distance. Source 12. If you see, I can take this to mean even from two or three, a distance of two or three miles away. Therefore, scripture teaches if you encounter. If you encounter, I could take this literally to mean that you bump into the animal. Therefore, scripture teaches if you see. In other words, the use of those two terms, if you see and if you encounter, were designed to have a place, uh, the distance required for which, from which you are required to help your enemy at a certain point, midpoint. How can these verses be reconciled? The rabbis estimated that encountering upon seeing is a distance of one part in seven and a half of a mile, namely a stadion. In this case, too, it would seem that an earlier oral version of the rabbinic ruling simply used stadion. The rabbis estimated that encountering upon seeing is a distance of a stadion. But by the time of its formulation in this Mishnah, the stadion was obsolete in Palestine, and therefore the awkward words, one part in seven and a half of a mile, namely, were added. A similar phenomenon is attested in Mishnah Yoma 6.4, which tells of the ritual of the scapegoat in the temple on the Day of Atonement, which, of course, only took place until the year 70 when the temple was destroyed. According to rabbinic tradition, the scapegoat was escorted by a priest from the temple in Jerusalem to a cliff in the desert from which it was thrown. Mishnah Yoma 6.4.5, source 13, reads as follows. Prominent Jerusalemites would escort him, namely the priest who is uh, t carrying this scapegoat, to the first booth. There were 10 booths from Jerusalem to the cliff, a distance of 90 stadia, there being seven and a half stadia to a mile. At each booth they say to him, here is food, here is water, and they escort him from booth to booth. This mission is traditionally dated to the first century CE. The use of the stadion would indicate that it predates the ubiquitousness of the Roman milestone in Palestine and the translation of stadia into miles, there being seven and a half stadia to a mile, would indicate that by the time the Mishnah as a corpus was redacted at the beginning of the third century, the stadion was obsolete and had to be explained in terms of the mile. The mile had thus replaced the stadion in Jewish Palestine over the course of the first two centuries of the Common Era. And our suggestion is that this is due to the ubiquitousness of the milestone on the roads of Palestine by mid-second century. My impression is that that same cannot be said of Greek literature from late, late antiquity, in which the measurement in stadia is preferred, despite the fact that milestones were no less ubiquitous in Asia Minor and Syria than they were in Palestine. In fact, it would seem that the Greek word milion, when used, either refers to the miliaria, the milestones themselves, or else it is the measure of a mile inscribed in Greek on the milestone, or else the author is converting miles to stadia for the benefit of his reader, as we saw in some of the rabbinic texts. One exception is the well-known passage cited above from the Sermon of the on the Mount, if anyone presses you into service for one mile, go with him too. But this was likely translated from Aramaic, and in any case, relates to Galilean Jews conscripted into service by a Roman soldier, conscription which could be compelled up to the distance of a Roman mile. So it's not surprising that the mile is used there. If my impression is correct, and unlike in rabbinic literature, the mile did not replace the stadion in Byzantine Greek, despite the ubiquitous milestone, I would posit the following reason. Actually, as I was listening to Avner's lecture, another reason occurred to me. I'm not sure of the association. I like my other reason better, so I think I'll give that reason. Why this was the stadion used? The mile and the stadion both are things that people could envision in their mind. If you walk along a, a lot of along roads and you see a milestone at every mile, you know what a mile looks like. A stadion is the course around a race course or a running course or a horse racing course or whatever it is, and people knew what that looked like and were able to think about it. The rabbis, as we'll see in a second, uh, while a mi Roman mile is called a meal in Hebrew and Aramaic, the rabbis did not call a stade a stade. The Hebrew and Jewish Aramaic word for stadion, both in the sense of unit of distance and in the sense of stadium or race course, is ris. 
a word connected by lexicographers to the words for race course in Armenian and Persian, from which the measure of a stadion is, of course, derived. I have no explanation for why the Jews called it a ris. Uh, it's not found in Syriac. In Syriac, we have lots of words like stada and istada and istadion. Um, but except the only explanation I could think of is to posit that the stadion had been used as a measure by the Jews in the land of Israel as early as the Persian period, the fifth or fourth centuries before the Common Era. But afterwards, in the Hellenistic period, Reis meant nothing to the Jews, while Mayo meant everything to them because they saw it at intervals on the road. And in the uh, Greek-speaking world, stadion still meant something because they called it a stadion and it was the distance around the race course. The last issue I would like to discuss is perhaps the most interesting, the unique rabbinic use of the mile as a measure of time. Kedei hiluch mil, the time it takes to walk a mile, estimated by most halachic authorities today at 18 minutes. I won't go into the question of why, if they think it's only a kilometer, it takes 18 minutes to walk it. That's a, a whole other issue. But in general, the 18 minutes does seem to reflect the actual Roman mile. In the ancient world, time was measured in hours by looking at the sun or at its shadow on a sundial and by water clocks where the water flowed through uh, a certain amount of time. We have no evidence for the use of water clocks by the Jews of Palestine, and daytime hours are generally delineated as parts of the day, which people estimated by looking at the sun. The measurement of time at night was thus precluded, and I have elsewhere argued that the Jews of Roman Palestine used a star clock based on the position of circumpolar constellations in the sky. Okay. The rabbis were punctilious in defining halachic requirements with precision, as we have seen in nearly every one of the examples cited so far. They regulated precise distances to require, require to fulfill the requirements of prayer, washing, casting away sin on the scapegoat, etc. Now, the earliest. Um, how does it, but how does, if you can determine the uh, times of day by looking at the sun, how do you determine shorter periods of time? If the sun determines the rabbinic hour, what determines the rabbinic minute? The answer is the mile. After meals, a blessing is recited. According to the Mishnah, source 14 on your handout, if one forgot to recite this blessing, he may, must do so when he remembers, providing the food has not yet been digested. How does one know if the food has been digested? In source 15 on the bottom here, Ravami said that Reish Lakish said, what is the duration of digestion as long as it takes to walk four miles? A second example concerns the duration of twilight, um, which is very important for determining the time the Sabbath begins and the Sabbath ends. I won't read the whole long passages. I will just uh, show you. Um, let's just read the end. How many stars must appear before it may be considered night? There's an answer. And then at the second paragraph, it was stated, as long as the eastern sky is red, it is certainly daylight. When it turns silver, it is twilight. When it turns black all the way from zenith to horizon, it is night. What is twilight? From after sundown, the time a man needs to walk a half a mile, the words of Rabbi Nehemia. And other opinions are found in the Babylonian Talmud. Um, Rabbi Nehemia says, the middle, I'm reading from the middle, the duration of the twilight period is the time it takes for a person to walk half a mile after the sun sets. It was stated, what is the duration of twilight? Rabbi said that Rav Yehuda said that Samuel said it is the time it takes to walk three parts of a mile, three quarters of a mile. And Rav Yosef said that Rav Yehuda said that Samuel said the duration of twilight is two parts of a mile, two thirds of a mile. Okay, what? Okay, I will, I'll just... Uh, Switch to the end, very well. Um, in any event, it would seem that the use of the mile to measure time is unique to rabbinic literature. 
It too is a convenient byproduct of the ubiquitousness of the Roman milestone, which had the fortunate incidental benefit of providing an easy means to measure short periods of time that cannot be determined by staring at the sky. As far as I know, this time measurement is unattested in the literature of other peoples in the Roman Empire who could also have availed themselves of this means of telling time. As I said before, measuring distance by time, vechstunde, the day's journey, and such, and such, is common. But only the Jews seem to have measured time by distance. Why is that? The only reason I could think of is that precision time telling simply does not come up in ancient literature. That is not to say it wasn't used. Husbands throughout the Roman world may very well have said to their wives, honey, I'll be back in three quarters of a mile. But literature would have no reason to preserve such conversations. One might expect to find something like this in monastic traditions or canon law, but apparently the rabbi's approach to ritual was more pedantic. It was this pedantry that preserved the precious ancient connection between timekeeping and the Roman road, and the fact that the mile was the measure of both distance and time in rabbinic halacha attests to the importance of the Roman milestone in shaping the Jewish sense of time and space. Thank you so much for this <clears throat> intriguing combination of ancient Roman artifacts and Talmudic literature. <clears throat> Let me start with one pedantic remark. <clears throat> you show a photograph of milestones at <clears throat> Beit Sturman. <clears throat> they, um, uh, they don't belong to the Scythopolis Tiberius Road, but to the uh, Scythopolis Legio, uh, Legio Megiddo Road. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> Sorry, um, uh, and um, a practical issue which may or may not be uh, relevant for your topic <coughs> is that the um, the spread of milestones <coughs> in this country um, reached its uh, maximum by the late second century. <clears throat> so if we are talking of the late first, there was almost nothing. The period when milestones were placed and kept up, late second and third century. <clears throat> In the Byzantine period, well, they were around still, but they didn't keep, keep them up. <clears throat> but now, uh, perhaps on to more serious questions by more learned well, that actually very well. Mm, yeah. um, um, thanks, Moshe, for a really um, very rich paper. Um, I, I have two, um, quite, well, one remark and one uh, question. So, uh, first, I was really struck by your findings that in the Greek language you have a more kind of conservative attitude um, and the stadia is preserved, whereas in rabbinic literature you get um, the Roman mile um, uh, adopted and then the New Testament also adopts it. And, and I think that's... I have very often come across these kind of patterns, and, and um, I, I would suggest that the New Testament, which also mentions the Roman dinar, is, is, is kind of has this more updated Roman flair to it. And perhaps we can also wonder whether, in the Greek language, it's so often the old word is used also to apply to Roman um, um, reality. So perhaps that there may also be some kind of Stadia in the Greek later le Greek literature referring actually to the to the Roman to the Roman mile. So that but that that was just right. I, the example I had to skip because of the end. The the parsang, actually, which is four miles. They used the word mile instead of parsang in Babylonia because even though they meant four miles and not one mile. So okay. it's a similar phenomenon to what Very, you described. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and 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 the question I have is regarding the your first example. Um, because it seems to me that that's a bit different from all the other examples which kind of um, reflect engagement with the reality of Roman milestones. And the first one is about the, um, the, the choice or the possibility of rejecting each other's judges. And, um, and, um, and the Jerusalem Talmud then concluding that you can go as far as nine miles from each either defendant or um, the plaintiff. And I, I just wondered, the, I mean, the, the case seems to refer to Roman law. 
And it seems to refer to litigation, not the normal court, because only when, it, when we talk about Roman litigation, can, is there a possibility in Roman law of rejecting the, 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 the judge? And so I just wondered whether the, the nine miles there is also in the Roman law courts. Um, and I, I, that's I, then <laughs> out of that tradition and not of the reality of, you know, the inspired by the reality of the milestones. Ah, well, the, no, the only thing that's inspired by the reality of the milestones is the fact that everybody knew that the town of Mashkina was equidistant because of the milestones yeah. between Sepphoris yeah. and Tiberias. Yeah. That's nothing, otherwise it has nothing really to do with milestones. It's just they were trying to say, one rabbi said, you should go to the higher court, and the other one said, go to either court. All of these, this discussion is based on a very, very specific passage in the first uh, the first Mishnah, or the first three Mishnayot of chapter three of Masachet Sanhedrin, of Tractate Sanhedrin, which seems to describe a court system that's completely different than the rabbinical court system, and was in fact a, 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 um, an, apparently an option within the Roman uh, system to choose your own uh, um, borurim, they call them there, I forgot, arbit arb arbitrators or arbitration. So um, that's really, that's, I've written an article about that, and there's a lot of discussion as how that fits in with the regular rabbinic judicial system, but you're right. This is very much a part of that short period of time, maybe, or long period of time, in which the, law, the general laws of uh, Jewish uh, jurisprudence were rejected in favor of making Jewish law sort of a, an, a little uh, enclave in the Roman system through the process of arbitration. In other words, where you choose your rabbis as your arbitrators. I was very interested in your um, discussion of the transfer between time and distance. And I wonder if you... Um, sorry, is that... But that sorry. I was interested in the, in the transfer between time and distance. And I wonder if it, you could compare it um, to the fact that in the Talmudic literature, um, an egg is used usually as a measure of volume. But there are times when an egg becomes a measure of time. The time taken to cook an egg, or the time taken to eat an egg. Right. Okay, well, all of that, that, those are all solutions to a basic problem, which is how you measure minutes in a way that means anything to common people. In other words, the average person who has to follow these rules, whatever they are, can't look at a watch. And if they have to know what's uh, three minutes, what's 20 minutes, I mean, that particular example that you gave occurs in a rather risque right. discussion of, <laughs> I don't want to go into that particular thing, and I'm not sure how seriously, although there are a number of time limits there for how long coitus should take from the time that people come together. But uh, that's, uh, uh, by and large, the, the way this is used is the time it takes to walk two-thirds of a mile, a mile, uh, four miles, a parsing. In other words, and that, that I think, is, a, uh, is uh, um, a, real, a, real, a real important uh, contribution that the Roman milestone gave to people's lives. Because that means that everybody had a way of talking about both space and time that they could think about in their minds. It's not perfect, of course, because I might think of walking a mile in a certain amount of time, and you might think of walking around a mile in a different amount of time. And if there's something important halachically that depends on that, like whether matzah dough has risen or not, that could be a very big issue. But still, uh, I think that uh, it was better than nothing, basically. And time was a real problem. Time was a problem, measuring time in a way that everybody can understand. Brief, brief comment on the imagination of distance, where you ended with the milestones. If you go to the first proper ordnance survey map of Palestine, um, the British map of 1865, you'll find that they give six different measurements of distance, six different scales. They give the French, the Russian, and the English, which reflects the politics of the day. 
but then they also give Greek, Roman, Babylonian, yeah, and Hebrew, nice. <laughs> ancient ones, because of course when you look at a map, you're bound to be imagining it through ancient sources. Right, very and good. And so you see it continues in the I'd same way. That's, a long a, that's quite an intellectual crowd that would be looking at that those maps, but that's a good thing. It's nice that they did that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, about the uniqueness of this Jewish uh, tradition, uh, from, if I understand you correctly, so let's say this is something different from Aristotelian physics that we measure uh, time by distance. Yeah? So this is the opposite. But in all Babylonian world, you have this uh, uh, notion of uh, two hours, two hours uh, uh, division, uh, of the daylight, 12 hours, uh, uh, 12 hours of the daylight, so you have two hours which corresponds to the distance and to the time. And they use it from old Babylonian period continuously up to the near Syrian period. Uh, Are you talking about the distance that the sun travels in the yes, sky? Yes, exactly. Yes, okay, exactly. of course. So these two, <laughs> two hours, they correspond also for the distance uh, continuously. So how long it takes for two hours to cover a certain uh, 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 territory, and it corresponds to time. So, right, but that was what I said in the beginning. The, the Vechstunde, the time it takes to walk an hour, is a is a combat concept all over Europe. There are other things like that in the Bible itself. It says the the quails were spread a dis one, one one day's walk journey on each side of the camp. There's all sorts of um, discussions like that. It's the opposite that we don't have. We don't have people who are describing, using distance, walked, to describe time. I, I don't, I, mean, I, I looked around and I obviously, I couldn't look at every, every culture and every text from every culture. I couldn't even look for, at all the uh, texts of languages that I have some familiarity with, like Greek, Latin, and Syriac, but I did look at a random selection, and I think enough to see that this just doesn't exist, and I think it doesn't exist because it doesn't come up, frankly. There's no reason why you have to talk about an, a, a, the difference between 14 minutes and uh, 12 minutes, it's, but for Sabbath law, you do, because the rabbis were a little crazy about these things. Thank you. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> um, I just think this is sort of something that you left unsaid, and you should clarify, I think, in light of the last question. Fixed time, right, is something that the rabbis do use, right? They use the third hour and the ninth hour and the fourth hour, like in, in the parallel sources in the New Testament. Absolutely. Hours yes. in which the sun crosses across the sky... That's fine. That, but that I'm only talking about shorter hour, periods yes. of time, right? Um, and I think the, the and the the mile and its derivatives, right? The time it takes to walk is a way to describe time independent of all that. Well, you you have to because to tell you how long uh, yes, yes. It, how long is eighteen minutes? You can't see eighteen minutes exactly. on the sky. You can't see yes, twelve yes. minutes on the sky. You could see an hour even is a problem. Mm -hmm. Two hours, okay. You can take the whole thing and divide it into six, but less than that, I think they really needed this, and it served them well. And luckily, they had milestones. We don't have milestones. If you ask people today a kilometer, I think they're less familiar with it with, than perhaps people were then. They're very familiar with kilometers per hour because they're looking at their uh, <laughs> their speed. Uh, oh, except nowadays, of course, with the Fitbit and the uh, Apple Watches and everything. <laughs> I think they do know about those things. But uh, um, this was a very convenient thing that the rabbis took advantage of. So now I think we've time for half a mile of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much.